So get your Bibles and open up with me to Matthew chapter 28. Very familiar passage. Today, I want to talk to you about the ordinances or the sacraments of the church. They we're very blessed this morning. We're observing both of these, baptism and the Lord's Supper. That is a special day in the life of our church as we stop and, and we celebrate the good news. And we thought, think about how the gospel is reflected in the ordinances or the sacraments. Now, I want to address something. Should we call them ordinances or should we call them sacraments? Can I, can I suggest to you, call it whichever one you want, all right? Uh, if you look back in the history of the church and you go all the way back, the word sacrament is, uh, uh, comes from the Latin word sacramentum. Well, what happened in the early churches when they were reading the Greek Bible and uh, the translation, every time they would find the word mystery, they would mysterion, they would translate it into Latin as sacramentum. And what happened was as the early church began to think about that, let's stop and think about that for a minute. Um, basically, they were talking about something that's a symbol for something else. And so as they looked at the Lord's Supper and baptism, they began to refer to them as sacraments. These are pictures of something uh, ab about the gospel. They reflect, as you're going to see in a few moments, the, something about important Christian teaching and doctrine. And so they referred to them as sacraments. Now, when you get into the time of the Reformation, in order to separate Protestants and Catholics a little bit further from each other, they began to refer to these as the ordinances, okay? And referring to the fact since Jesus ordained these and Jesus instructed us to do them, that we should carry them out. I'm going to be honest with you. It doesn't matter to me which name you use, ordinance or sacrament. The important thing is you understand that in these two pictures, we see the gospel, so I want to talk to you for just a moment about the meaning and the importance of baptism. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Here we have a command from Jesus, and we all know this passage. Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority and heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now in your Bible, It'd be good if you either underlined or circled the words, make disciples. That is the command in this passage. That is the imperative. Now, the next set of participles he gives explains how we go about carrying out that command to make disciples. When we ask ourselves, why do we exist as a church? We exist to make disciples. Today, we've seen two young people who have taken a first step in that by confessing their faith publicly in Jesus. But we have now a responsibility to those two young people as to teach them and, and help them to grow in their faith. The word disciple simply means to be a follower. But it carries a very strong sense of personal attachment. Back in, in Jesus' day, if you became someone's disciple, it was more than just sitting in a classroom. It was more than just kind of hanging out and listening to a lecture. There was a personal attachment between the teacher and the student that went with being a disciple. A lot of times they would use that word to describe someone who was learning a trade. Let's say you wanted to go and learn to be a blacksmith or you wanted to learn to become a tanner or you wanted to learn to become a shepherd or whatever occupation you would find somebody who was very skilled in that job, and then you would become their disciple. You would become their follower, and they, you would follow them around. You would sit with them. You would spend almost every moment of your time learning from that person how to do that trade, eventually so you could teach other people. Well, when Jesus instructs us about what we are to do as a church, he says that we are to go and make disciples. Now, the first participle is there's go, all right? We need to go out into the world. Why do we pray every Sunday for our missionaries? Why do we partner with Nova Vitae? Why do we, and by the way, I'm trying to learn a little bit of Italian. Uh, I've learned to say, hey, how are you? 
No, I'm not. I love Jack. Jack's got a great sense of humor. And, um, and, uh, but uh, we, we, why do we partner with churches in Chicago? Why do we partner with churches in France? Why do we do all of these things? Well, because the Bible tells us to go and make disciples. Part of that means that there's an activity where we've got to leave this place and we've got to go out into the world, and we've got to share the gospel. I love hearing every Wednesday night when we have prayer meeting. And boy, last Wednesday night was an incredible prayer meeting. As people were sharing over and over again, we ask them, you got any, some, what's God doing in your life? You got a testimony to share. And it's wonderful to hear about people who get physical healings, and it's wonderful to hear about, you know, other things that God has provided for us. But the thing that really amazes me is that almost every week we hear people saying, you know what, I got to share my go the gospel with my friend. I got to share my gospel with, or the gospel with a relative. I got to share the gospel with somebody this week that I was an acquaintance with. That is going. But then he also says that we are to baptize them. Now, the word baptize here is very interesting. The Greek word baptizio means to immerse. It actually comes from the uh, dyeing trade. Now, dyeing in the sense that they were dyeing fabric. So they take a piece of cloth and to change its color into whatever, let's say they want to take a white cloth and turn it into a blue cloth, they would dip it down into dye. That, that word, baptizio, means to dunk that well, a piece of cloth, immerse it in the dye so that there's this transformation that happens. Well, Jesus tells us as we go and we share the gospel, the person publicly professes their faith through the act of baptism. You can see that in Acts chapter 2. When Peter finishes preaching that first day, what happens? They respond in faith and then they are baptized. It becomes their identification that they are believers. Now, baptism does not save us. It does not change our relationship with Jesus. Understand this. We are born in sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all born separated from God. Jesus came to live a perfect life for us, to give his life in our place on the cross, to pay the penalty. And when we put our faith and trust in him, we're saved or born again, however you want to describe that. That is that change that happens in our life. Now, the way that we profess that and the way that we symbolize that is through baptism. The Bible is very clear about this, that we are saved by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. How are we saved? We are saved by faith. Faith, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In Acts chapter 16, when they're preaching the gospel, they say it this way, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's the command that we're given, right? We put our faith in trust and we trust him and at that moment, a change happens in our life. When I was a nine-year-old boy, 10-year-old boy, I can remember uh, uh, going home one night after church, kneeling down beside my bed. I confessed that I was a sinner. I, I confessed to God that I deserved to spend eternity separated from him, but I placed my faith in Jesus. I said, Lord Jesus, I know that you died on the cross for me. I know that, that uh, you paid the penalty, and I ask you to save me. And he did. The next Sunday, I went forward in church and was, later on was baptized. Now, my baptism didn't save me, but it was a picture of salvation. Now, I want you to hear this. Very often in Scripture, we'll see baptism and salvation be put in close proximity to one another. Let me give an example of that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch has just made a profession of faith. And this is what Peter said. I'm sorry, this is at the day of Pentecost. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the day of Pentecost. Peter said to the people at the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, if you read that verse apart from all of the other verses that I just read to you, you'd say, well, the way that you're saved is you repent and you're baptized and your baptism is part of your salvation. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says it's very similarly. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now again, it sounds in that verse, if you took it apart from all the other verses that I just read, Ephesians chapter two and Romans chapter 10 and all of those other verses, you'd say, well, in order to be saved, you gotta have faith and you also have to be baptized. But there's something that happens in Mark that I want you to notice. Look at that verse. He says, whoever believes and is, ba and is baptized will be saved. But notice this, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. He's, he's pointing out that the more important of those two elements is belief. And that's because consistently what the Bible shows us is that our baptism is really our first step of obedience after salvation. The moment we give our life to Christ, there is a desire to identify with him. I like to use this illustration of it. Imagine if you had a couple that came up here and they were going to get married and they were standing before us and um, we got to that point in the wedding ceremony where they were to exchange rings and uh, the young man took out his ring and he was going to place it on his bride's finger and she said, I'd rather not. I want to marry you, but I don't want anybody else to know about it. You'd start saying... I don't know if that marriage is going to last very well, right? Well, think about it in that terms with baptism. The moment that we're saved, we want to obey Jesus in every area of life. Listen to me. This is something important about salvation I want you to hear. Salvation is not primarily, being born again, is not primarily about going to heaven when we die. It's not. That's merely our destination. Being a born-again believer is not so much about getting to heaven when you die, but following Jesus for eternity. You hear me? I was sitting down the other day with little Ella, who just got baptized, and I asked her to explain the gospel to me, and she did a very good job of it. I asked her what it means. What's it mean to be saved? And I love what she said. She just simply said these words. It means to follow Jesus. And then we had a discussion about what that meant. It's not just about going to heaven when you die. See, a lot of people want fire insurance. They, want to, they, they don't want to go to hell after they die. So they say, well, if I could just say some magic words or if I could just pray a, a little prayer and I could go to heaven and just live the way I want to live for the rest of my life, they think that's salvation. The Bible knows nothing of that. That is not at all what Scripture teaches. If you watch, when you see people converted in Scripture, what happened? It is a radical transformation of their lives. They stop being what they were, and they, the Bible says it this way, they become a new creation. They become, look at Peter. Peter left his job as a fisherman and followed Jesus being his disciple. That's a, a radical transformation. And baptism pictures that. It's a picture of really three different things. First of all, it is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The word baptizio means to immerse, and so that's why we immerse a person under water, uh, because we believe that's the proper biblical mode uh, from Scripture. And so what is it symbolizing? It's symbolizing as we lay that person back under the water, the death and burial of Jesus. And then as they are uh, brought back up, symbolizing the resurrection of Jesus. But we're also symbolizing something else. That when that person is laid back under the water, it is a symbol that through their salvation, they have died to that old way of living. That old person is gone. And now they have been raised to walk in a new way of living. They are now followers of Jesus. A radical transformation has taken place in their life. And they're publicly telling that to the whole world. Everybody following me? It is a beautiful picture. It's a, there's a third picture, too. That one of these days we're physically going to die. We don't like that idea. But one of these days, we're not going to be here. We're going to die. 
And even though we physically die, our soul goes on to be with God in heaven. But one of these days, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says, the graves are going to be open, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we'll put on a new man. We will put on a new body, a body that has been transformed into the same uh, likeness of Jesus. That's what 1 John says. John says, we don't know what we're going to be like. We just know we're going to be like him. All of that is pictured in our baptism. So every time we celebrate baptism, we are, symbolize, we, are, we are celebrating that a person has come to faith in Christ. We're symbolizing they've been made a new person. We're also, in our church, symbolizing that they have become, and announcing they have become part of our body, local body of believers, and a part of the church universal. It is a symbol of our salvation. I like to say it this way. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ and our communion with him and the saints. Amen? It is a picture of both of those things. But there's also the Lord's Supper. We're going to come here in just a few moments and celebrate the Lord's Supper. So what is the meaning and the purpose of the Lord's Supper? Well, turn over with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, if you would. Luke chapter 22. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he instituted the Lord's Supper. Now, he did so, if you'll notice there in Luke chapter 22, verse 7, the Bible says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Now, this is important. The New Testament connects the Lord's Supper and the Passover meal. Now, you remember what the Passover was. Back in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were getting ready to leave Egypt, on the night that they were leaving, God had commanded each Israelite family to take a lamb and to sacrifice it, and they would eat that as the Passover lamb. And they were to take some of the blood of that lamb and mark it on their doorpost. That way, that night, when the angel of God passed over both the Egyptians and the Israelites, on every door where he saw the blood marked on the door, he would pass over it. But on every door where the blood had not been applied, he would take and kill the firstborn in that family. It was a horrible horrible punishment upon the Israelite people and, or the Egyptian people and on any, of the, on any of the Israelites that did not participate. And it was a ordinance that they were to respond, they were to do every year. It was a reminder to them of the greatest deliverance in the Old Testament. It was to get them to look back and remember how God had brought them out of slavery to himself in the promised land. But it was also a picture of something else. All through the Old Testament, every time that sin had to be forgiven, it was there a lamb or an animal would have to be sacrificed, and it was symbolizing that something must die in order to pay the penalty for sin. And every time they celebrated the Lord's Supper or the uh, Passover, they were looking back at how God had delivered them. They were looking forward to how God would send the Messiah to deliver them. When Jesus comes... He celebrates what I like to think of as the last Passover. From that moment on, he was going to give them a new memorial meal. This memorial meal would symbolize his death and his sacrifice. Notice what he says in Luke chapter 22, beginning there in verse number 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of it, of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this real quick so you'll know what's going to happen when we uh, 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 give you the elements. You're going to get two cups at one time. When you take them out this morning in the trays, there are two cups. First cup has the juice. Second cup has the bread. The cup. It is a symbol of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The 
Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When man sinned, remember what God had told him? He said, you can eat of any tree of the garden that you want to, except this one. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, you've sinned. And you must surely die if you do that. And they sinned. They ate of the tree. And spiritually, they were immediately separated from God. We see that because they run away from God. They don't want to be around him anymore. They try to run and hide. Do you remember what God did? God took some, some animals. We don't know what kind they were. And he took and he sacrificed them. And he made skins to cover their nakedness, but also that blood was a temporary covering for their sin. And every Old Testament sacrifice was simply a temporary covering. But the Bikra Hebrews tells us that Jesus came once and for all. He made the perfect sacrifice for our sin on the cross. And when we take this cup, yes, it might just be grape juice, but is a symbol, is a picture of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for us. Then he said, we're going to take the bread. The bread is a symbol of his broken body. It is a reminder to us of one of the most incredible things that is taught in all of Scripture, that God the Son, put on human flesh. I, that is endlessly fascinating to me. Because when we see Jesus come to earth, we see some things that are amazing. First of all, he had lived for all of eternity with the Father. He was omnipresent. He was everywhere all the time, but he put on human flesh and he became in one place at one time. We see that he becomes subject to the Father and that he only carries out the will of the Father. He's not doing anything on his own. He's demonstrating us what the Christian life should look like, which is a perfect submission to the will of the Father. He suffers. He's tempted. He got hungry. He got tired. I imagine, Coach, he got frustrated every once in a while, don't you? If you were hanging around with those disciples, would you, would you ever have a ball team like the disciples that were that obstinate? They just drive you crazy. Every time he tells them to do something, they do the opposite. He must have gotten frustrated at times. Yet, the Bible says, he was without sin. And when we take of the Lord's Supper, it is a reminder. I like to say it this way. The Lord's Supper is a memorial meal with a prophetic element. It looks back like the Passover looked back at God's deliverance of, out of Egypt. The Lord's Supper looks back at the cross. It looks back at what Jesus did for us. But there's a prophetic element in that it looks forward because what does Jesus say? I'm not participate in this until I do it with you again. He's reminding us that he does not participate in the Lord's Supper till we're in heaven with him. It is a looking forward. One of these days, one of these days, if you're a believer, we're going to go home and we're going to have perfect communion with Jesus. And it is looking forward to that moment and that day. There's something else that it does. It is a reminder to us of our unity. In the early church, they would, uh, we don't do it this way because we live in a post-COVID germaphobic world that we're not sure how to do all of this. But in the early church, they drank from one cup and they ate from one loaf. They'd hand the cup around and they would drink from it. They would hand a loaf of bread around. And it was a beautiful picture of their unity in Christ. That's why when Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, he's a little worried about them. They've broken up into these little groups. They've all kind of divided up, and they're kind of fussing with one another, and there's a little click over here and a little click over there, and the unity of the church has been harmed. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul realizes that when they come to the Lord's Supper, this should be a picture of our unity. Why? Because it doesn't matter what background we came from. We all come to Jesus the same way. We all are sinners. This is the wonderful thing that connects all human beings in the world together, these simple truths. Every single one of us is created in the image of God. We are all fallen in sin. We are all objects of God's love and affection. And for those that turn and trust him as Lord and Savior, we become part of one family. It doesn't matter. Every once in a while, Cliff and I I, I, will, will talk about some of our young people and what God's doing in their life. We have a little saying sometimes. We have some unique personalities here at our church. Would you all agree? Say amen. That means we got some weird people that go to our church. Everybody has a little different personality. And every once in a while, Cliff will say to me about someone, they're a mess, but they're our mess. They're our mess. You guys did something the other day that I just want to thank you as a pastor. We have one of our fellows here. I think he's here somewhere this morning. Bob Bryant sitting back there. Bob's going through a hard time, very ill, very sick. Got to come home from the hospital the other day. I don't know the total numbers, but a whole bunch of our men and a lot of our young students went over to their house, cut his grass, help clean up. You know why they did that? They did that because they love Jesus, and because they love Jesus, they love Bob. They might not have anything in common with Bob. I saw Finley Jeffords sitting on Bob. Please tell me you didn't let that girl drive the zero turn. Praise God. All right, I saw that picture and shivers went down because she's a mess. She's our mess, but she's a mess. What did they do? They were demonstrating that because of the gospel, we are a family. God has brought us together. There is a union that comes as a result, and we celebrate that when we come to the Lord's table. That's why Paul's telling them, before you come to the Lord's table, you make sure you've talked to God. Make sure that you've got all your sin confessed. Make sure that there's no break in the unity of the church. Make sure that you understand the seriousness of this. This is one thing I think we miss sometimes as Baptists, and I'm going to get on us here for a little bit. Sometimes as Baptists, we're proud. We say, well, man, we're a people of the book. Very often in doing that, we miss the reverence that we should have. When we take this Lord's Supper and we drink the cup that represents his blood and we eat the bread that represents his body, do you understand that those are precious in God's sight? While we may not believe that this becomes the literal body and the the literal blood and the literal body, these are symbols. And to God, they mean a great deal. It would be like if you went into someone's home and they had a picture of a loved one on their wall and you made fun of that picture. That would be very offensive to you. When we come and we take the Lord's Supper and we're not reverent about it, we're not serious about it, not only does it say something about us, but it's offensive to God. So we must take great care as we take the Lord's Supper. It should be a time of joy in the sense that we're celebrating our salvation, but it also should be a reminder of the horrible cost for our salvation. As we take the Lord's Supper, we should examine ourselves. Is there anyone against whom you hold a grudge, anyone you've not forgiven, anyone who you hate, anyone uh, uh, is there, that you're harboring bitterness or resentment or jealousy? Not only is it a symbol of our unity, but the Lord's Supper is a great opportunity for us to rededicate our lives. That's something we probably should be doing every single week. We, we talk as Baptists, well, that person rededicated their life. Like that should only happen once. A, a, that should happen about every day. <laughs> Amen? 
Get up in the morning and say, this is a day that God has given me. This is an opportunity for us to take a few moments and recommit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and to rededicate ourselves and be motivated for the mission. Let me say it this way. The fact that we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today reminds us the work's not done yet. Why do we send missionaries all over the world? The work's not done yet. Why do we have vacation Bible school and do all of that work and that effort? Why are they going to be calling people on the phone this week, inviting them to church? Why are we doing follow-up activities? Why do we all do it? Because the work is not done yet. One day it will be, but today it's not. And here we're looking forward and we're being motivated for the mission that God has given us. Amen? I want us to stand and we're going to have a time of invitation before the Lord's Supper this morning. This is an important moment. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life where you've turned from your sin and you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today. You've heard the gospel. We've explained it to you in the elements of the, of the, of the two ordinances. Now, will you come and will you respond? Will you say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I, I'm turning away from my sin and I'm trusting you as Lord and Savior. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you professed faith in Christ in, bat, in Sunday school or, or maybe here recently somewhere else. And today you need to make it public and you need to present yourself to the church for baptism. This is the time. Maybe you're here today and you are a believer, but you need to rededicate yourself and, and maybe there's some things you need to pray about. The altar is open. Rededicate yourself. And once we're finished with this, then we'll go in and we'll, we'll observe the Lord's Supper.